On the 24th of November in 1971, a man who looked like a regular businessman hijacked a plane headed for Seattle. Most people on board were oblivious to what was happening. He then somehow collected a huge ransom and vanished, never to be seen again. It happened like this. The man known as Dan Cooper, or D.B. Cooper, bought a one-way ticket from Portland to Seattle. He boarded Northwest Orient Airlines Flight 305 and settled into his seat. Normally, a trip like this would take about 30 minutes. Initially, nothing would suggest that this flight would be irregular. It would have been a busy day to travel, as it was just before Thanksgiving, but the man was dressed in a black suit and tie and held a briefcase so he looked like any other typical businessman taking a short flight to another city. The FBI would later describe his appearance as a white male, 6 foot 1 inches tall, 170 to 175 pounds, age mid 40s with olive complexion, brown eyes, black hair, conventional cut parted on the left. He ordered a drink, a bourbon and soda and lit a cigarette, which at the time was normal and settled into a seat. And then he flagged down a female flight attendant named Florence Schaffner and handed her a piece of paper. Assuming it was just another businessman flirting with her and trying to slip her his number, she put the paper in her pocket. But Cooper then leaned forward and told her, Miss, you better look at that note. I have a bomb. Florence opened the note and there, written in capital letters, was the words, I have a bomb in my briefcase. I want you to sit next to me. Shakily, she collapsed into the seat beside the man. He then opened his briefcase. Inside appeared to be wires and dynamite. He then calmly made his demands to Florence. I want 200,000 by 5 p.m. in cash. Put it in a knapsack. I want two back parachutes and two front parachutes. When we land, I want a fuel truck ready to refuel. No funny stuff or I'll do the job. Florence then wrote the demands out on a note of her own. Another flight attendant named Tina Mucklau saw Florence sitting beside the man and thought it was strange. She approached them and saw Cooper's note on the ground. She picked it up and read it and realised what was happening. Florence then left for the cockpit with Cooper's demands and he asked Tina to take her place sitting beside him, which she did. In later interviews, she would describe him as nice and calm. He seemed totally in control of himself and the situation. Tina from this point acted as his liaison with the cockpit, relaying messages back and forth. She also lit his cigarettes and offered him more drinks, which he declined. They spoke during the flight. He offered her a cigarette, asked where she was from and seemed to be familiar with the terrain as he looked out the window. She asked him why he had picked Northwest Airlines to hijack. He laughed and replied, It's not because I have a grudge against your airlines, it's just because I have a grudge. He then explained to her that this flight simply suited his needs. Once the pilots were aware of the situation, they had to make a decision. They decided not to tell the passengers on board about the bomb to avoid panic, so instead they said they would have to circle the airport for a while to let off some excess fuel because of a minor mechanical difficulty. After about two hours, the plane landed in Seattle. In this two hours, the FBI scrambled to get the money together and the parachutes. Cooper had been clever by asking for four. If he'd asked for one or two, the authorities may have tampered with them. But by asking for four, they thought he might take a hostage. So they had to make sure the parachutes were okay. Cooper had minimal interaction with the other passengers. Bill Mitchell, a young college student, sat across the aisle from Cooper, but he never became aware of the hijacking. He dismissed the hijacker as some kind of flashy businessman, smoking, chatting with the flight attendants and wearing sunglasses. He was a little jealous. After the plane started circling, another passenger named George Labissonnaire visited the restroom behind Cooper multiple times. On one occasion, he recalled a man in a cowboy hat talking to Tina and questioning her about the mechanical issue. Cooper told the man to return to his seat, but he ignored him and eventually 
it was Tina and George who convinced him to do so. Tina thought he might have been an air marshal, but despite his brief interaction with Cooper, the cowboy was never interviewed by the FBI and was never identified. At about 5.45pm, the plane landed in Seattle. The pilot parked the plane on a partially lit runway away from the terminal. Before landing, he had confirmed with Cooper that the parachutes and money had been delivered to the terminal. The FBI had photographed every bill of money to keep track of the serial numbers, and the parachutes had come from a local skydiving school. Only one representative from the airline was allowed to approach the plane, and the only entrance allowed would be through the plane's mobile stairs at the front. The representative delivered the money outside the plane and a ground crew attached the stairs. The passengers remained seated and Tina went out and got the money and carried it to the back of the aircraft to Cooper. He then agreed to release the passengers. Once they disembarked, he inspected the money. Tensions were now running high, so Tina jokingly asked if she could have some of the money. Cooper agreed and handed her a wad of cash, but she explained it was against company policy to accept gratuities. The passengers had now all safely been evacuated. Only the six crew and Cooper remained on board. Tina then made three trips outside again to retrieve the parachutes. During this time, the two other flight attendants, including Florence Schaffner, asked to leave the plane and Cooper agreed. The refueling process was slow. A second and third truck had to be used. This aggravated Cooper and he complained it was taking too long. He also complained that the money had been delivered in a cloth bag instead of a knapsack. Using a pocket knife, he tore open one of the reserve parachutes and used its canopy as a bag. He then delivered his next instructions to the pilots. They were to head southeast towards Mexico City at a minimum airspeed and at a very low altitude at 10,000 feet. He also said the landing gear must stay open. The wing flaps be lowered 15 degrees and the cabin should remain unpressurized. The captain argued that at this configuration, the plane would need to refuel before reaching Mexico. So they agreed on a refuel in Reno. He also demanded that they take off with the rear door open and staircase down. The airline argued this would be unsafe, but Cooper replied, it can be done, do it. Finally, they agreed to lower the stairs while airborne. Two hours after the plane had landed in Seattle, at about 7.40 p.m., the plane took off again with Cooper, Tina and the three pilots on board. Three fighter jets trailed the plane, out of sight of Cooper. A few minutes after the plane had taken off, Cooper asked for the stairs to be lowered. Tina was afraid of doing this and being sucked out of the aircraft. After some back and forth, Cooper said he would do it himself. He ordered her to head to the cockpit and not to return. Before leaving, she pleaded with him to take the bomb with him. He said he would. The last thing she saw was him standing in the aisle, tying the money bag around his waist. She remained in the cockpit for the rest of the flight. At around 8pm, a warning light in the cockpit went off. The stairs had been lowered. The pilot contacted Cooper over the intercom, asking if he needed any help, to which he responded simply, no. The air pressure in the cabin had dropped and the crew's ears popped. About 15 minutes later, the plane pitched upward and the pilot had to correct. The crew remained in the cockpit. They repeatedly used the intercom to inform Cooper that they needed to put the stairs back up to land safely and to inform him they were approaching Reno. None of the crew got any response. They weren't sure if he was still on board or not anymore. At about 11pm, the plane landed with the stairs still down. FBI and local and state police surrounded the aircraft, but weren't sure if the hijacker was still on board. After about half an hour, once the pilot had searched the plane, they boarded. Cooper was gone, and there was no sign of any bomb. Immediately, an investigation began. They found 66 fingerprints, a clip-on black tie, a pearl tie clip, and two of the four parachutes. The FBI interviewed witnesses and developed a series of composite sketches. One of the initial suspects was a Portland man named D.B. Cooper, who had a small criminal background, but was quickly eliminated as a suspect. The media confused this name with the name the actual hijacker used, Dan Cooper, and before anyone caught the mistake, the name had been printed everywhere, 
and so the name stuck as a pseudonym for the hijacker ever since. The legend of D.B. Cooper was born. Finding him would be difficult. The area covered was large and the flight path varied along with the plane's speed. The jets flying behind the plane didn't see anybody jump and he was dressed all in black. And it was night. In December of that same year, the president of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, approved the use of the Air Force to retrace the flight's path. An SR-71 Blackbird aircraft made five attempts to do so, but all proved unsuccessful. They even tried to recreate the hijacking and jump by pushing a 91 kg sled out the back of the aircraft with the stairs down, resulting in the upward pitch. They managed to narrow the area down to near the community of Ariel, Washington, a largely wooded area near Lake Merwin, an artificial lake formed by a dam on the Lewis River. The FBI and police searched large areas of woodland and farm by helicopter and went door to door of houses. They also ran patrol boats along the river. Neither Cooper or any of his equipment were found. In spring the next year, after the thaw, they tried again but ultimately found nothing related to the hijacking. In March, the FBI concluded that he probably jumped over the town of La Center, Washington. This would later be challenged and the area was believed to be further north, near the Washougal Valley. This area was repeatedly searched in the years after and it is also believed that if any evidence was there, it may have been destroyed by the eruption of the nearby Mount St. Helens volcano in 1980. The investigation was officially suspended in 2016 by the FBI, citing the need to focus manpower and resources on more important and recent cases. However, over the years, there have been dozens of theories and suspects about who D.B. Cooper was, why he did it and how he got away with it. During the search, the FBI recovered four major pieces of evidence. The tie, the tie clip, hair from Cooper's seat, and eight cigarette butts. In 2009, a group of internet sleuths found rare earth metals on the tie. This suggested Cooper may have worked for someone like Boeing or a metal fabrication facility, maybe even working on aircraft. The hair sample was unfortunately lost over the years, along with the cigarette butts, so DNA could not be extracted from them. And the money, of course, was never fully recovered. A few years after the hijacking, however, a young boy was holidaying with his family on the Columbia River, about 32 kilometers southwest of Ariel. He was raking the riverbank to build a campfire and discovered three packets of the ransom cash, totaling nearly $6,000. The bills were damaged from exposure, but the FBI confirmed they were the same given to Cooper. This discovery ultimately led to more questions than answers. Debate ranged about how the bills ended up there and where they may originally have been dropped. Were the bills buried or did they float downriver? The bills remain the only piece of physical evidence discovered from the hijacking outside the plane. The parachutes also raised speculation about Cooper's background and experience. Of the two reserve front chutes given to Cooper, it was revealed that one of them was an unusable training chute. It wasn't functional and also was not on the plane when it landed in Reno. It was argued that an experienced parachutist would have known this and not used the chute. It was also revealed, however, that the main chute didn't have D-rings to clip on a reserve chute anyway, so we don't know if Cooper actually used it or threw it away. Tina Mucklow had stated that Cooper had torn one of the chutes open and used it as a money bag, so again, it's not 100% clear where the other chutes went. In 1978, a deer hunter found a placard with instructions for lowering the stairs near Lake Merwin, but the used chutes were never recovered. The FBI made multiple sketches of Cooper's face. The initial sketch, composite sketch A, was made in November of 1971, shortly after the hijacking. This sketch was not accurate. Witnesses said the face was too narrow and the look was too disinterested for it to be him. In late 1972, the FBI tried again. They created Composite Sketch B. The skin tone and the features of the face seemed to be more accurate, but the face seemed a little angry for witnesses. They also said it looked a little bit too old to be Cooper. 
So, over the winter of 1973, this sketch was revised and agreed upon as the definitive sketch of Cooper. Flight attendants said it was a very close resemblance to the hijacker and that he would be easily recognised from this sketch. Suspect profiling of Cooper was difficult because it relied solely on witness testimony. Witnesses described him as a little shorter than average, with brown features and eyes. He may have had some Mexican or Native American heritage. He also may have had some military or Air Force training. He had correctly identified an airbase from the window sitting next to Tina. He was in good physical condition. He spoke well and understood aviation terminology. He may have been in severe financial difficulties as most hijackers are to attempt something so risky. But he may have also just done it for the thrill or to see if it could be done. It is speculated he may have taken the alias Dan Cooper from a fictional character from a Belgian comic, a test pilot involved in various heroic adventures and parachuting exploits. These comics were never translated into English, but it's possible the hijacker encountered them on military service in Europe. Certainly, based on the evidence, the hijacking was well thought out and planned. Cooper sat at the back so that he could observe everything happening. He chose a bomb instead of a gun so that he could not be easily disarmed. He asked for four parachutes instead of one, and he demanded all evidence, including notes and matches, were returned to him before leaving. He also had extensive knowledge of the aircraft. He knew about the staircase and that it could be lowered during flight, something a regular civilian would not know, and what speed and altitude to fly for a jump. He also seemed aware of fueling and refueling time and procedures and the local area, landscape and surroundings. Did he survive the jump though? The plane was travelling at 172 miles per hour. It was night time, cold and Cooper was wearing loafers with no helmet. He did not have an accomplice on the ground to help him and the area he supposedly landed in would have been filled with trees and obstacles. It seemed impossible. However, over the next few months, five different men attempted copycat hijackings and all survived the jump. Most notable were a 49-year-old Frederick Hanneman who hijacked a 727 and jumped into the Honduran jungle and Richard Lapointe who, wearing only a shirt, trousers and cowboy boots, jumped into the freezing January wind over northern Colorado and landed in the snow. The list of possible suspects seem endless. Between 1971 and 2016, the FBI profiled over a thousand serious suspects, ranging from criminals, publicity seekers and deathbed confessors. Some of the most interesting include Richard McCoy, an army vet who served in Vietnam, an avid skydiver. He staged a copycat hijacking in 1972. Robert Rackshaw, also a Vietnam veteran, arrested for fake explosive possession and attempting to fake his own death. In later years, a TV program and book would emerge attempting to link him to the case. There was Dan Briggs, a cocaine dealer who died in a mysterious car accident in 1980, and Dwayne Weber, whose wife said admitted he was D.B. Cooper on his deathbed and Sheridan Preston, who died in 2021, but always seemed to enjoy talking about and alluding to the fact that it may have been him. It is likely we will never know who D.P. Cooper really was. What we do know is that things changed after he jumped. A spate of copycat hijacking occurred in the years after, leading to many changes in security and protocols in the airline industry. Before Cooper, taking a flight wasn't much different to taking a bus. Airlines were keen to attract passengers and tried to keep flying as relaxed and seamless as possible to boost business and comfort. After Cooper, bags were searched, the ability to use the stairs was stopped during flight and peepholes were added to the cockpit. And slowly, over the years, security at airports and on planes got more and more strict. For me, this story is intriguing because there is a certain element of sticking it to the man with this case. The hijacker was not violent, rude or disrespectful. He was calm and confident and even charming as far as some of the flight attendants recalled. What he did had never been done before and his story inspired decades of copycats and media attention. There is a border between terror and heroism that the hijacker flirted with. Whether you agree with his actions or not, nobody was physically hurted and in the end, the airline flourished for years before merging with Delta. 
they made their money regardless. In fact, even the young boy who found the money managed to sell some bills at auction for the equivalent of 50 grand in today's money. D.B. Cooper undoubtedly took a risk that paid off. Imagine strapping a parachute and money to you and lowering those stairs. It's freezing, windy, loud, dark, and you are alone. Clinging to the stairs, you slowly put one foot in front of the other and shakily make your way to the bottom. It's worked. All the planning that you did, all the adjustments you had to make, the hostages safely on the ground. You can walk away with the money and nobody will ever find you. All you have to do is let go and jump into the night sky. Could you do it? <laughs>